taking some notes while others were speaking. One of the things I want us to think about is um, manure can be an opportunity. When we're looking at our large farms, um, we often will say, OK, somebody needs to deal with the milking. Somebody needs to deal with the feeding. Somebody needs to deal with the manure. It can be really a benefit to farms of any size. Um, or it can be a problem. So if we can make it into that benefit that it, that it is generally, um, I think that's a real positive thing. Siting, very important. And I think we all have different setback differences. Uh, we all have different rules in different states. So I won't dictate any of those things. Um, rules are going to vary uh, depending on the state that you're in, how it's regulated, depth to ground water, distance to surface water, uh, and soil type. Um, siting considerations, you know, away from ground and surface water, out of fields being grazed, maybe rotate windrows so you're not, or windrows or storage so you're not uh, concentrating nutrients in the same place all the time. And I'll go into that a little bit more as we go through some of these. Um, convenience. If it's more convenient to put it over there by the stream, <laughs> that's not a good thing. And a lot of times I'm a canoeer, kayaker. A lot of times I see all that stuff in the streams and I know where it's coming from, leaves, manure. You know, we don't want that. So we want to have a place that's convenient that they're going to want to put it. Um, and seasonality. We might change locations through the season. I'm going to look at some different pads and then I'm going to get into some structures. But um, there are different kinds of pads. This is just a soil pad. Uh, this happens to be poultry manure. They um, graduated to a different pad because this wasn't adequate enough for the amount of manure that they were storing there. And this is not a large farm. It's a very specialty poultry operation. But, um, you know, on a smaller end, I'll go through some different size fields as well. But soil pads can work. Uh, sometimes we'll actually go ahead and till them, pull the rocks out of them, and go ahead and compact those with a vibratory roller. And that makes a good surface for somebody to work on. And most of the time, our pads really are a place to work on. We saw a picture that Mike had on there that was the bad example. Um, when we don't have a surface that we can work on, then we're going to end up with rutting and, and standing water and all that kind of stuff. And that can be problematic. Uh, improved surfaces. We'll go with um, different things like uh, milling, asphalt millings. Asphalt millings are available in a lot of communities. We don't really realize that, but when they take up roads, asphalt roads, they um, have piles and piles of this stuff. And some of it gets used back in the roads, but some of it needs home. So in uh, manure storage composting, that we encourage people to use both um, asphalt millings and um, some of the concretes, so you get milled concrete as well from buildings that are being taken apart, from um, surfaces that are being taken up. And those are, in my opinion, less permanent. We don't need a jackhammer to take them apart, but they're doing their job. They're allowing us to work on those, and um, we're not getting a lot of rutting, and we can change land use when we decide to do something differently. This is one of my uh, probably favorite Pad, favorite types of pads, and that's a cloth and gravel bed, pad. Very simple. We generally will go ahead and push the topsoil to the edges and either use that for something else, berm the site. Uh, there are lots of, lots of reasons to uh, move the topsoil because it's got value. Then they put down a, a geotextile, a cloth, and then gravel or bank run or you know, concrete millings or something like that. On top of that, then they vibrate that, and put a vibratory roller on that, and um, makes a great surface. At first, you might, when you're picking up manure or you're picking up um, or trying to turn, if it's a comp if you're actually composting, um, you might get some rocks in the beginning. But after a while, that settles it settles right down, and it makes a beautiful surface. And I can ride, you know, I can drive cars that have no clearance on those 365 days a year and never get stuck. So, you know, they really are very, very effective. And RCS has a standard for them. They're using more and more of those. 
because they're seeing that, okay, this is uh, something that's meeting uh, perk tests that we need, and it, it's also uh, protected but not permanent. This is an interesting pad, and I always show this one because it's just so crazy. It looks like it's overexposed, and it's not. It's actually a pad in Vermont that's made of granite. And it's their waste product, so we use our waste products in different places, and we all have different things that are like, <laughs> okay, why are we using granite that way? But this happened to be a brand new granite pad because the, the granite, the granite uh, is right near that farm, so they just did a trade for it. Another type of surface um, that we're using more and more, when we have a manure, we have something that's going to, uh, that's, that's liquidy, that's, that's loose, honey, might be wet. We may put down a, a um, wood chip or a fiber pad below that. And we're doing a lot in composting because a lot of times people can't get enough um, carbon in their compost when they're mixing it. So we'll put that on the bottom. That absorbs a lot of the liquid that's coming out and it all stays in that medium. So we're not losing that into the ground and that, again, can be spread or we can continue to compost it. Some, some very small farm composting. This is an organic farm where they take in, they have 100 cows um, and they also take in lake weed and a couple of other materials and they're composting it. And as you can see here, we talked a little bit for references to filter strips, the vegeta vegetated properties. This place is great. They've got vegetation. It's taking up those extra nutrients. And I think we can do an awful lot with buffer strips. And again, we looked to the NRCS standards for all of that stuff. So I'm really glad to see the NRCS people here um, because they're a huge help for us when we're citing things and, and doing all that kind of stuff. And nobody else has standards, and you guys do, so. <laughs> I'm going to move into structures a little bit. Um, and these, again, are small. This is a small poultry farm. And most of our poultry farms, we have probably about, I should back up a little bit, we probably have 350 far, uh, farms that comp are uh, composting operations in New York. Um, so there's a lot of them. The poultries are all undercover. All of them have decided that the material is too wet and it gets too messy when they leave it out. We do have one or two that leave it out still and compost outside. Most of our composting facilities and manure storage facilities are in the open, as Mike was referring to. Um, we really do a lot of it outdoors. But there are reasons why we want to do things indoors and with more of this intensity that I'm going to get into um, with some of these, these slides. Um, works well in the winter. They don't have to worry about things. They can keep things moving, uh, to keep things somewhat from freezing. But small piles don't work real well in the north in general, just because they do freeze. Um, forest aeration, we've heard a little mention of that. And we can do very small forest aeration. And I'm going to show you in the end, I'm going to show you a, a concept that really could be beneficial in a lot of ways. That's forest air. Multi-bin systems, I like multi-bin systems for home scale. I like them for medium scale. I like them for large scale. And that's because it keeps people organized. They can put the stuff, material in one, and it doesn't have to have a roof. It can be roof or roofless. Uh, put the material in one, fill it up, move it into the next one. Fill it up, move it in, into the next one. And um, I'm going to show uh, I'll wait a second. Um, one of the things that you really have to be careful about when you're designing these things is figure out what size bucket or, or skid steer or whatever though that farm has and make sure that it fits in there. <laughs> you know, so we design, we're working with schools right now to compost food waste and we design those depending on what bucket that school has. And we just say, okay, it's a five, five and a half foot bucket so we're gonna, you know, five and a half wide foot bucket, we're gonna design it six feet. And clearance, absolutely, and clearance. And I like big clearance, and we'll talk about that when we get to some of the storage. Um, we're putting in some of these manure storages like this that are cement. Um, the cement ones are quite expensive. So I really encourage people, if they're going to do something like this and they want to do have a cement structure, I'm not going to discourage that totally, 
but you might want to think about using highway dividers. There are a lot of older highway dividers that can't be used for their initial purpose and work very well. We call them Jersey barriers and, and highway dividers, and I've heard a whole bunch of what they were calling them something else in Montana, I know, and I can't remember what they were referring to, but we use them a lot, and you'll see some mafia blocks. Well, that's a New Jersey one, too. <laughs> I grew up in that area, so <laughs> in New York. But um, another reason that we want to have some storage is actually for, for if we decide to make compost product out of this, to store that compost product not when we're making it, but when we're, when it's finished. Because when we're making it, it's active and it's blowing off steam. When it is uh, finished, it's a sponge and it's sucking up moisture. And it's really hard to have a good product that is saturated. Nobody wants it because it's really hard to spread and it's really hard to use. Yes. Yep. Um, others, and this is a, a quite a bit larger, but again, it's a small, smaller hen house poultry again. Uh, this was a situation where they had a disease outbreak and they needed to deal with that disease in the facility. And it's really important that if those birds are are diseased and they're in a facility, that we keep them in that facility, that we manage them in that facility. And generally it's going to be through some kind of disinfection, like composting or, or other things. Um, we keep them in there. We close, down, close it down and let it compost. And we can, we can manage a disease in about seven days in, in a manner like this. And some of the small farms are the culprits. So we really have to be careful that they may be bringing in birds from different places and they may end up with disease issues. And so I know a lot of people are very nervous about the home, home blocks and things like that because it is a, it, it can potentially spread disease to the larger farm. Uh, these are turkeys. Um, other smaller um, bins, and this is a, a bin system. That this is, happens to be made out of mahogany, pretty beautiful. <laughs> it happens to be in Brazil. I was working with some people down there, and they have these operations where it's their Geneva experiment station, or their experiment station. And they were composting um, butcher waste in those. But they were storing the manure and the butcher waste in there, and then those sides actually come off. And they're very versatile that way. So it's kind of nice to have that versatility and to be able to not just be able to use a pitchfork, but be able to get that skid steer loader in there so you don't have to do all the work. Um, we all like to be active, but sometimes it's beyond us. Yep. Height, storage sheds. So when we're really using, um, if we have compost that we're storing or manure that we're storing, we may want to have those high tops because then we can use a lot of different material and when it's a finished product we can stack that pretty high and we don't have to have as large a footprint when we're doing that. Just, uh, <clears throat> just some other just other pictures of, of composting that's being done. This happens to be um, roadkill. Um, but just those small storage bins that work pretty well. This is a system that I like a lot. Um, building, it's relatively small. They can be sized all different ways. We use them in 45 prisons in New York State. But it's a really nice design. And the reason that it works so well, and they, they're actually composting food waste in those. That's the prisoners compost their food waste. Um, they actually compost food waste in there, and they've got the, the, the Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, it's not working. Okay. The three-quarter uh, sides, so those are push walls, so they can work material in there. We can use them to store equipment, other things in there. So it's a very versatile building. It also, up on the top there, it has a vented roof. When we're trying to store manure or store or, or make compost in a building, we're going to eat the building. So we really want to be careful about how we make the how how we vent the building, how we make the building, what we make the building of, and a lot of times we'll use wooden roofs on those buildings because the uh, volatile organic acids from the manure or the compost both will eat that roof in about seven to ten years, and you'll be replacing that. There's another way that they deal with some of that, and that is with a, a coating. Uh, if they want to use an aluminum 
they can get, they can actually coat those roofs and they can get about I think they say they can get 10 to 20 years out of that. Um, but I like these facilities. They're really very versatile and very, very, very simple. The person that designed these uh, really had his head on right and, and was looking at simplicity. It's a pole barn. It's not very expensive. I was talking about the containment blocks, um, just those. And this is a large farm. That's a 2,000 cow farm. But just being able to use those containment blocks works really well. This farm actually has had added perforated PVC pipes in those to add more aeration into the system. This is one that I just want to share with you because it can be scaled all different ways. And um, it's a heat transfer thing. We think about digesters as energy producers, but we can actually cut, we can actually generate a lot of energy from uh, manure. And it's through uh, through composting. And what they've done here is, uh, and I'll show you a couple slides of this operation. There are a bunch of these going in. We have one in New York, another one going in, and we have three or four in Vermont right now. But what they're doing is they're taking the manure and using it as a bank, and then sucking the heat off of that bank, and either heating hot water or generating uh, electricity with it. So it can be done at all different scales, and it's very simple. It's just you know, think about about think about this room filled five feet with uh, five feet high with with manure and having air channels down the center. This actually was one that they cut the air channels in. It was an existing building and they retrofitted it. Uh, this is one that they're building from the bottom up. And what they've done is they put the PVC pipes in the floor and then they put, you see in the next picture, they put a board there and we're really trying to keep those holes from getting plugged up and keep them cleanable. Um, they put the boards down. Then they, we also put some uh, carbonaceous material down on the bottom so that we're keeping nice, light, uh, comp this is composting, compostable uh, materials there. Now, do we need to sign anything to get This facility actually produces 4 to 5 million BTUs per day with the system. And it's not. I'd say that system actually is this room halfway, about half of that room, and that's what they're producing. So it, it draws the material, it draws the heat through the pile. So we usually blow when we're composting. Those systems blow. We suck. So we're sucking it through pipes in the floor. So all that heat is captured. It goes in to uh, heat the hot water. In one, one of the farms, it's actually running through the floors of a barn. So it's heating that barn or that facility. It's a heifer facility. Um, that that needs a little bit of heat, not a lot of heat, but they're getting 130 degree uh, water in those tanks. Another one of the operations actually uses it for wash water because they need that much. But it's looking at things more holistically because we can take the energy from that so we have product upon product upon product when they're selling that manure uh, after that or using it for their nutrient needs on farm. Um, I just wanted to, to throw this one in here because people don't think about this, and that's composting liquids. Um, we have problems with liquid manure. We have problems with whey, with acid whey from cheese and uh, uh, yogurt. The Greek yogurt industry is taking over, um, and there's a lot of acid whey out there that has to be managed. I was in Idaho a couple weeks ago, and they have a big plant that they're having problems with. In New York, we're trying to be the yogurt capital because our governor said we should be the yogurt capital. And it's a great aspiration, but we have to deal with all the waste that comes with all of that stuff. So this is a compost operation in Vermont where they compost 15,000 gallons of Ben and Jerry's waste each week. And they can put that in, in each pile each week. So we have to think harder about some of those liquids that we wouldn't have thought about uh, using. It's not something that's easy to put into a digester. This probably could go into a digester, but some of them can't go into digesters. So looking at, at that kind of thing. Drum composters, they come in all different sizes. Some of our farms are using them for bedding recovery units. We're bedding our animals with partially composted manure. And I'm not advocating either way, whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. It seems to be working pretty well for some farms. Um, but they're actually treating it for a couple days in those drums. 
And I'll just end with um, digestion. We really haven't achieved digestion for small operations. Um, it just doesn't, we just don't have the economy of scale there. And I know other people are talking about digestion tomorrow um, on larger scale farms. And we do a lot of digestion between human waste and and animal waste. We have about 17, uh, I think 17 digesters or so on farms in New York right now that are generating energy and selling energy. So, and I think that's it.